combatives was designed to deal with the worst case scenario. <laughs> When people look at movies, they think that's the way that people fight. And this is martial arts. You go to a martial art class, you go to a traditional karate class, and you look at it, and it's very clean, very fine motor skills, and it looks good, and it looks great for the movies. Now, combatives is more Western, it's more Westernized. It's very, it looks very scrappy. When people look at it, and especially when we pressure test and we do stuff like that, people look at it and they think, that doesn't look like anything else. It's real fight, it's street fighting. Uh, combatives was designed for soldiers at first, okay, so it's basically uh, uh, conceptual ideas and principles uh, that have proven to work under extreme fight duress and adrenal stress, so pain, fear, fatigue, disorientation and all that stuff. So it's basically really plugging the mental, emotional and adrenal response in training. This is neural based learning. So. Combatives is not martial art. If you, if you put martial art, you basically take the art and you just stay with the martial. And that's what combatives are. It's basically, we put ourselves out there. We, you know, at first we work on tool development, how to impact hard equally, you know, equally with uh, dominant side, non-dominant side. And once you know how to use these tools, which are palm strike, hammer face, elbow, knee, headbutt, you know, all this stuff. Once you learn how to use all these, then we put it into scenarios and we plug in the adrenal response in there as well by using dialogue, deceptive kinesis, deceptive dialogue, you know, role play, insult, everything with, to reconstruct uh, an actual scenario of how it would actually happen in real life. You got a uh, proactive physical dynamic, which is preemption. I see something first and I see a pre-threat indicator. I'm not waiting because if I wait for a confirmation, very often the confirmation will come in form of an assault on my persona or, or my loved ones. And if that's a knife, then I already got stabbed. I'm not gonna wait until that happens. So proactive physical dynamic would uh, be, be preemptive. Do something first. If you have a uh, reason to believe that your life is in danger or the life of your loved one is in danger, because the person in front of you is giving you some sort of pre-threat indicator, then I wouldn't wait, just hit first. So the person is standing in front of you, all of a sudden start clenching his jaw and, and throwing at you, and all of a sudden he start clenching his fist, and all of a sudden he starts shifting his weight and his hand disappears in the background that he's looking at you in an aggressive manner. How much more information than that do you need to know that you need to do something? At the end of the day, your life and your safety is the most important thing. Because uh, if your house is being broken into at three o'clock in the morning, it's gonna take a long time. First of all, if you have, will you have the opportunity to take your phone and ring the police while you're getting robbed? Or you're gonna have to deal with it. Do you know what I mean? You have to choose one or the other. While you ring the police, you're getting beat up. You know, you have to take this matter into your own hands. And that's just how it is. So you need to be ready on a mental and emotional level to deal with the worst case scenario, even if it means taking a life, because that's what it amounts to. Right, what we're gonna do, there's gonna be a proactive physical dynamic and there's gonna be a reactive physical dynamic. So, you know, different scenarios, we're all used to scenario training anyway, so we can have the role play in there. Uh, either it's gonna be a proactive physical dynamic where, uh, you know, you're gonna give me some pre-threat indicators and I'm gonna act upon it and I'm gonna be preemptive. Either we're gonna do it with one shot and one shot and it's done, or I have to continue my assault with forward pressure and, you know, using the, the UC game plan, basically. So that's what we're gonna do now at the bar. Uh, you know, there's gonna be a scenario where there's two people standing here and it's between these two people. And then towards the end, it's gonna be third uh, person protection where there's two people here, one is giving shit to the other. And, you know, I, I get in there and I see that my mate is in, is in danger, so I intervene. And yeah, that's basically what we're doing right now in the bar. The reactive physical dynamic, try my best to be situationally and environmentally aware at all time. It can happen sometimes that I turn and whoa, I got this big dude right in front of me. What if when I turn, that big dude is right in front of me and he grabs me and start hitting me. Now I'm, I'm in a reactive dyna physical dynamic, which is I'm getting hit. So I got this adrenal dump, I got all these physiological factors, and now it's really difficult, but what I have to do is reverse the predatory prey role. You're giving him some shit, and all of a sudden, let's say, he's turning around a little bit to try and control the situation with his hands, yeah? And like, you might tell him, what the fuck, you got your hands up, what the fuck, yeah, put your fucking hands down and grab that bottle and maybe start, start bitting on him with that bottle. 
If I see something first and I've got good level of observation, then I can see things first before they happen. And if I can avoid an escape, then it's always the best solution. Do you know what I mean? So I can always avoid an escape. If I can't avoid an escape, then I'm going to try to de-escalate and talk it down. If I can't avoid escape or de-escalate, then I have to fight. And the, the best chances of success is me to go first. If I know that I tried to avoid, I tried to escape, I tried to de-escalate, no, it's not working. I'm going to have to use force. And I'm not going to wait until he's going to do something to me. I'm going to deal with him right there and then. You know what I mean? And uh, obviously there is a force to threat parallel that's very important to stay within the realm of legalities where, you know, if the threat is here, then your level of force should be here. So if somebody uh, pulls a blade, he's here, and you got nothing, you're here. If you grab a bar stool, all of a second, you have equalized the situation by grabbing something. Now you're on the same level, and you're using a force to threat parallel. So there, as you grab the bottle, shoom, there, and that's enough, and I'm getting gone, yeah? This, this is a sort of scenario where it's the ideal type of scenario, where I hit him once, I connected properly, there was a concussive effect, and straight away I knock him down, I knock him out, and that's me gone. Now, if he doesn't get knocked out straight away, I'm going to have to continue my assault with forward pressure until he's not posing a threat anymore, and then I'll be gone. Yeah? Fuck, I caught oh, you. Fuck, mate, mate. Oh shit. I'm wide over there, kid. Ah! Uh, right. One sec. First aid. <laughs> fuck, not good. So hold it, I'm gonna get my little bag. Yeah. Sorry, John. It's alright, bro. I was gonna need a few stitches, though. Uh, <laughs> that was the elbow, though, innit? That was the elbow, mate. Yeah. It went through. Fuck. It went right through. Good elbow, Julian. Fuck. Sorry, John. Yeah, bro, it's okay. Well, you know, that's that's How the these that, happen, I that's the risk when we do that sort of thing. Where it's not nice to uh, hurt each other. Do you know what I mean? Like I say, we try to go as close sorry. as possible. Eh? Got some strips in the car. Okay. Try to stay as close as possible from reality, but the thing is that we want to avoid hurting each other as well. And that's why I said there is a gap between training and reality. You can't, you can never completely, you know, take that gap away. There's always going to be a gap. I wanted to have different locations because I wanted to reconstruct uh, scenarios, different types of scenarios. So, you know, the type of scenarios where you are inside a pub, at the bar, and you're just minding your own business. You're just there to have a drink or maybe meet some friends or whatever. And uh, you got to deal with uh, a drunk person or somebody who is under the influence of drugs. The different type of people that you could have, so you could have uh, somebody coming at you next to the bar that's uh, a sociopath, for example, or a psychopath. Could be a good person having a bad day. Could be, like I said, it could be somebody that his boss uh, shouted at him all day long. He just had an argue with his wife. Uh, he couldn't go and see his son football match and he's, he's feeling all down and, you know, and he decides to go to the pub and have a drink. And you know, as he goes and order his drink, he turns around and boom, somebody just spilled all his drink all over his shirt. And that was the cherry on the cake. And he starts going off, off his, off his nut, he starts shouting. And, I, and you know, it's still a good person having a bad day, so you can still deal with a person like that by trying to de-escalate the situation. There's two ways that you could deal about, uh, you know, deal with it. It, you could either escalate or you could de-escalate. Well, nine times out of ten, if you deal with a good person having a bad day, you'll be able to de-escalate the situation. But now, if you, have, if you have to deal with somebody who's got psychopathic tendencies or who is a sociopath, somebody who has decided that's it, you're, you're having it today because I'm having a bad day and you're on my way and you're fucking having it today. And now, if you have to deal with somebody like that, then you know, there is only one way to deal with these people. You know, as my grandfather used to say, violence is not a solution, but sometimes it is. And, and when it is, it's the only solution. Right, what we're gonna do here is like three different types of scenario. The first scenario is a road rage scenario where I'm inside the car and let's say summer, it's not really summer now, it's the UK and it, the weather is fucking shit, but it is what it is. Imagine if it was summer, 
my windows is down and some guy is coming, he's agitated, he's pissed off and he's here and from there he might attack me from there, he might try and drag me out of my car, he might try that sort of thing. So it's the road rage type of scenario. That's the first type of scenario that we're going to work on. All right, man. Just, just, just relax, just relax, just relax, man, you relax. <laughs> Combatives is 90% mindset based and only 10% skill set. You need to get your mind right. You need to get the emotional software for the physical hardware to work. Knowing that when you when you walk around, everything around you is a, is a weapon. Everything can be used as a weapon. You've got different families of weapons. You've got a weapon by design, obviously, which are tools and instruments that have been designed either to kill, to wound, or to hunt. And when you buy them, you know what they are. They are weapon by design, improvised weapons. So things that are not weapon by design, but that you could, you know, put certain things together and improvise a weapon. Look, at, uh, for example, if you have half a brick on the floor and you take your shirt, wrap that, wrap that half a brick in your shirt, all of a sudden you got a kosh. Could be a decent sized padlock inside a beanie hat or snooker ball inside a sock. Right, so what's happening here is the type of scenario where he's accessing a weapon. Yeah, he's accessing a weapon and I need to shut him down as fast as I can. Depending on, you know, how aware I am, I might not see it coming, I might, I might hit the first one, but, you know, I need to continue fighting until there's nothing left to fight about. Um, really what I need to do, if my seatbelt is on, it's going to be really difficult for me to do something because it's designed to stop me moving fast, yeah? So what I would do, really from there, is kind of block from there and maybe trace the seatbelt down and take my seatbelt off and start uh, closing the gap, yeah, in order to deal with that. And then you have weapons of opportunity, which is literally everything, everything from a from a brush handle to a cup of tea to a plate to a, a bottle of shampoo. It could be anything like an old school uh, phone. You remember Nokia 3310? That was great for that. Then you have flexible weapons, which could be uh, cable, which could be clothing, uh, uh, a jacket. Uh, it could be a towel, wet towel that you could lash to the eye to set the groin kick. And then you got flexible impact weapon, a chain, a belt with a heavy buckle, that sort of thing. And then you have uh, projectiles, which would be anything that you can throw or spit. It could be fluid that you could drink and spit. You could uh, grab sand and throw sand in his face. It could be a, a squeeze a bottle with some washing liquid in there. It could be a spray, C CS gas, all that sort of thing. This would be regarded as a projectile. Or of course, the best known projectile known to man is firearms, of course. Situation where it could happen if I'm a taxi driver, and all of a sudden he's accessing a weapon and I've got to learn to deal with it because his job, he's got only one job, is just, just do it, is to, is, to, is to stab me, you know, so I could just be here and get stabbed or I could just, uh, you know, I could just, just break, break the fucking thing and try and pike as well, try and post with my leg and get that and from there, boom, boom, the head, goes, ah, the bite. I could use this here as well, use this, you know, to beat his, beat his hand against the, against the thing to make him release the blade, yeah? I got the headbutt here, yeah? And you see how I kind of pike, yeah? I kind of post with my leg as well to gain a position of higher ground. And that's the most important thing from here. So as, as he's attacking, I'm here and I'm, I need to post. So now I'm here, you see? And from there, boom, I got that, boom, I got this. If I can use this, I can maybe use this to get him to drop his blade, yeah? So I'm going to use every surface of the car. I'm going to use every surface of the car in a combative sense. If I use the steering wheel, maybe, maybe I have to bang his head against the steering wheel, yeah? I'm going to use the car. I'm going to use my environment, so... In that situation, you expect him to get stabbed a little bit? Of course. Look, there is no foolproof method when it comes to counterblade tactics, yeah? If uh, somebody is really pissed off and they want to put that piece of metal in you repeatedly, the chances are you're going to get stabbed or cut, yeah? So we're talking about damage limitation. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about a knife defense. That's movies. That's movies. In real life, I might not see it. I get the first one. Oh, yeah, give him the blade. In real life, I might not see it. I get the first one, fuck. Now I gotta make sure that I don't get stabbed anymore. Boom, boom, boom. And I'm there, yeah? 
So it's really situational awareness is the best form of self-protection. See things first before they happen and now I've got the time to respond. So shields are anything that you can put between you and the threat. It would be, for example, any old school shield or it could be a new school shield like they use in the riot forces, riot police forces, uh, or it could be a rucksack, it could be a decent sized laptop, it could be a dish, it could be a suitcase, it could be a bar stool, anything that's big enough to put between you and the threat momentarily to offer you some degree of protection. It could, it could also be tissue damaging weapons. It could be a, a blade, a knife, a piece of glass, broken bottle, uh, keys, nails, you name it, anything that's sharp that can open the skin with. These are the families of weapons. And then you got, uh, you got another one, which would be environmental weapon. And that's to answer your, your, your question. Environmental weapon is basically everything, everything, like walls, like floor, like surfaces, in priority corners, corners of walls, corners of table, edges, and stuff like that, that you can use to impact as well. Basically, if you can't take the weapon to the target, you can always take the target to the weapon. The corner of that wall, you're never gonna hit him as hard as the corner of that wall when you smash his head against it. So in that sense, everything is a weapon and we call that environmental weapon. So use of the environment or environmental damage. When you take somebody's head and bounce his head off the floor or off the wall, that would be regarded as environmental weapons. So everything is a weapon. It doesn't matter what it is. Of course, a sharp blade will be much more dangerous, but a piece of metal is a piece of metal. If you put the intention behind it, all these are tools there are inanimated objects that you can put on the floor, on the table, in the drawers. It's not going to hurt anyone. It takes the intention to cause deadly harm, to turn such an item into a weapon. So the, the real weapon is not the item. The real weapon is the intention to cause deadly harm. Right, so this type of scenario now is I'm going through a subway and there is two individual uh, standing against the wall. They're together, they're being predatory, they're looking to mug me. As I'm passing through, one of them is going to arrest my movement or is going to try to arrest my movement. I'm going to try to uh, manage the distance using situational control and he's going to give me a pre-threat indicator. He might shift his weight or his hand might disappear in the background like he's about to reach for something. So I'm going to hit him first. And either I hit him with enough juice and he drops because one shot was enough, but Life is not ideal, so you know if one shot is not enough, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to gain an attachment and I'm going to continue my assault with forward pressure until he's not posing a threat. At which point, if I'm uh, visual enough and I'm going to deal with him physically and I'm going to posture to deal with him uh, psychologically, so I'm going to tell him to stay back, which he might or might not do. Yeah, later on, we might do that. I'm going to tell him to stay back, but he's still going to come towards me and then we're going to use a cover crash encounter and uh, it's going to be a bit of a multiple opponent type of scenario. Like when we speak about awareness, there's three different types of awareness uh, for this sort of thing and for everything in life in general. Yeah, you got self-awareness, you got environmental awareness and you got situational awareness. The self-awareness relates to you, to who you are, how you deal in the stress, uh, how you deal with your adrenaline, um, you know, are you able to take a beating? Uh, what's your mindset? How do you, uh, you know, how do you deal with, with, with stress? That's knowing yourself, knowing your limits, and also asking yourself four difficult questions to ask yourself, which is, what do you live for? What are you ready to fight for? What are you ready to die for? And what are you ready to kill for? And these are the four questions that everyone should ask themselves at least once in their lifetime. And, and if you really think hard about it, then it's the same answer, you know? What you live for, what you're ready to fight for, to die for and to kill for is what you love, your loved ones. You know, it could be your, your family, it could be your, your wife, your kids, it could be your dog, your, your goldfish. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's something that keeps you alive. Then environmental awareness would relate to uh, knowing what's happening in your environment, in your immediate environment. So when you get into a, a place, you map the place. When I get into a restaurant, I map the place. I know that the tables are here. I know that there is a couple there, I know that there is an old couple there, there is a family there, and there there's two guys and one of them has got big cauliflower ears and the other one has got a flat nose and a big jaw, which indicates to me that they're, they're probably MMA fighters or grapplers or boxers. And, and I can see from their, from their facial expression, from their facial characteristic, from their build, I know that these two cuts can fight. I map the entrance where I got in, I'm walking, I'm gonna put my back to a wall so that I uh, retain a, a good level of observation. 
and I got a wall in my back so I don't have to worry about what's happening behind me. And the third type of awareness would be situational awareness. And that relates to the situation around you, what's happening around you at that moment. So even if I'm uh, using the same example of the restaurant where I'm sitting with my family and I'm focused on my family, obviously, I'm still aware, I still retain some level of observation because I'm switched on and, and, you know, and aware. You could be fixated on your family and, and just, just be close to the rest of the world, completely oblivious, and you're more likely to be selected as a prey. The simple fact that you show that you are aware People can see that. I know straight away when I'm walking the street, I know that guy is aware, that guy knows what's happening. Body language is 55% of communication, so it will give you a lot of information about a person. And then of course you got 38% auditory cue, like volume, pace, hesitation, and then you got 7% words. So if you only focus on words, you know, you might be lied to, it's very easy to be lied to if you focus only on words. Now if you focus on auditory cues, you get a bit, a, a bit of a better idea. And now if you focus on the body language, which is more than half of it, you will get a lot of information about people. So the goal really is to gather as much information as you can about the person before they get in your personal space. And you want to see 10 digits. I'm not happy if I don't see 10 digits, I'm not happy. I'm not going to let anyone get close to me if I don't see 10 digits. Even if I see nine, because there could be a blade here. Do you know what I mean? It could be a thumb, it could be cupped, it could be palm. If I don't see 10 digits, I'm not happy. So that's, that's what situational awareness is really, you know, being aware of what's happening around you, the situation, so that you got time to spot pre-threat indicators and, and respond rather than react. Right, now this scenario relates to counter-impact weapon, where he's got a stick, it could be a baseball bat, it could be a metal bat, it could be anything. It's an impact, it's a long impact weapon with concussive means yeah so what I want to do basically is from there is to cover up using a principle called the free C cover crash and counter which would be covering up to protect my head avoid getting knocked out and I'm gonna crash in like I said with this spear with that elbow I'm gonna crash in from there I'm gonna gain an attachment I'm gonna throw one or two knees to break his structure and I'm gonna use environmental damage which means I'm gonna use the wall to bash him about the wall and when he's there I might continue to strike because he's still holding the baton. Do you know what I mean? As, as long as he's still holding the weapon, I will continue beating down on him. Uh, as soon as he uh, lets the weapon go, then that's, that's, me, that's me done. Or as soon, even sometimes it could be that he's unconscious, he's still holding the fucking thing. Do you know, he, he, anything can happen. That's, that's what I'm saying. Right now, because of the way that the world has evolved and the way that violence has evolved, I think that combative is for everyone. Everyone should have that sort of knowledge because everyone should be safe. And, uh, you know, it's, it's adapting. It's really adapting to the reality of, of violence. And my main motivation, and I'd say that it's very similar for most people that teach martial arts or teach self-protection, is trauma. You know, we all have our traumas, you know, and everyone had to go through traumas. And I'm pretty sure that 90% of the, the, the good, some of the best names in the business are people that had to uh, face trauma. It's like I went through some shit and I suffered a lot and now I want to make sure that nobody else is going to suffer the way that I suffered, do you know what I mean? So I'm doing this for others, it's really based. Of course I love what I do, it, it, you know, it makes me happy to, uh, to do what I do because that's what I believe that's what I was born to do. But it is definitely about helping other people, you know, because I, I love people, I don't want people to suffer. And I know I have been suffering in my life, I know I'm still suffering every now and then, you know, we all have different lives. But yeah, I don't want other people to suffer. I have people coming to see me from all walks of life. I have mothers, I have uh, nurses, I have people working in schools, I have like all sorts of people. And sometimes I have people coming to see me saying to me, I don't think I'd be able to fight. I don't think I got it in me to, to fight. What would I do if I was faced with such individual again? Do you know, what, what would I do that would trigger things in me and I would probably freeze and you know, my job is not only to teach people how to fight, but it's also to teach people how to find it within themselves to fight back, if that makes any sense, because it's not that easy. It, it, for some people, it takes years and years and years to get over uh, psychological and emotional trauma. How do I uh, help a person find it within them to fight back?
And so, you know, very often I'll say, look, every mother is a killer. Said, and it's true, because every mother is a killer. I promise you, even the, the nicest person on earth who threatened to take her kids away from her and she's got a kitchen knife there, guess what, she'll fucking use it. Because, and that's why I said, every mother is a killer. So you need to find a motivation, and that's how I get it. I, 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 f I get them to find their motivation, and very often their motivation is their children. So you know, they might not be willing to fight for themselves, but as soon as uh, it's, it's about their children, boom, the mentality changes. There is a switch there. They find that switch within them, and they flick that switch on. So uh, that's what it is about for me. Why do I teach? because I want people to be safe. I want people to have a um, better level of observation, better understanding of personal protection and uh, learning how to get out of, you know, the worst type of situation because combatives were designed for the worst case scenario.